I'm James Hankin. I'm a professor in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University and the uh, curator of herpetology in the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. So um, one of the things that surprises many people is how many undiscovered, undescribed species of amphibians in the world there are. Since uh, mid-1980s, um, herpetologists like myself have been naming, uh, a, or the number of named species of amphibians has been increasing by about 3% a year. It's well more than doubled in the last 50 years. And these are species that are discovered in places that have been poorly studied. Uh, I and other people like me go to uh, places that haven't been visited by herpetologists before, and we find truly new species that nobody knew existed in other cases, uh, new species come about from new technologies that are now being used to understand the biology of amphibian species. And uh, for example, a once widely distributed species has now come to be understood as comprising several smaller geographically restricted species, which may all look alike, but we can tell them apart genetically using um, uh, particularly these days DNA sequence analysis. So when we go into the field to collect animals for research, we will um, take a little piece of tissue and put it in a uh, it, freeze it and then sequence the DNA and use that to, to understand if, uh, if this is a new species or if it's a species that's already been described. So you see here, uh, this is a one of our um, collection rows in the Museum of Comparative Zoology Herpetology Department. And each of these jars has one or more frogs in it. And you'll see that some of these species have a red ribbon. These are so-called holotypes. Every time somebody describes a new species, you identify or designate a particular specimen as the name bearer of that species. And you can see we have a lot of holotypes here in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And we're constantly adding to our collections here because um, there are so many new species of amphibians to be described. I have done field work in, uh, particularly in Central America on salamanders and in Southeast Asia and South America on frogs. And in the last um, couple of years, I've taken month long field trips to India, for example, and I and my Indian collaborators are in the process of describing, oh, I'd say around 15 new species of Indian frogs from both the Himalayan region in Northern India, uh, as well as the Western Ghats in Southern India. And there are many, many more new species to be described and named. Can you tell us why the extinction crisis is occurring? Now, one of the, at the same time that, uh, it, this is a very exciting time for amphibian biologists because we're discovering so many new species. There's a depressing other side of this coin, which is the ongoing um, uh, decline of amphibian populations worldwide. This was appreciated uh, as a global phenomenon in the mid 1980s, when herpetologists from all different parts of the world independently had noticed that po species or populations which were once very abundant are now uh, very rare or many, the population sizes have declined precipitously. And in some cases, tragically, entire species um, haven't been seen in many years. This is now a well-documented phenomenon um, and it's caused by all kinds of things. It's caused by habitat destruction. It's caused by climate change. Uh, it's caused by disease. There's a particularly insidious uh, fungus uh, called chytrid, which is decimating populations of amphibians in different parts of the world. This is a fungus that, as far as we know, has been around for a long time, and amphibians weren't particularly affected by it. Uh, and then suddenly, in the 20th century, the fungus changed a bit, and uh, amphibians populations, maybe because of climate change, uh, were put under, or pesticides or herbicides were put under greater stress and they succumbed to the fungus that they hadn't, that hadn't bothered them previously. So uh, it's a, if you will, a race against time 
to describe a name, discover a name, all of the species of amphibians that are alive today, but a much more difficult challenge is devising conservation solutions that will allow us to keep these, many of these species from going extinct. There are estimates that upwards of 40% of the world's species, and we're talking about many thousands of species, may uh, go extinct within, within the next 50 years. Um, there's even a species named after me, which is likely to go extinct in the next 25 to 50 years. This is a species found in Sri Lanka. It's found, at the, uh, found only on the mountaintops in the cloud forest uh, on isolated mountains in Sri Lanka. And what's happening as climate changes is the forest, as everything is getting warmer, the forest is moving up and up and up the mountaintop and with it, the frogs, uh, Pseudophilatus hankani, is moving up and up the mountain. Well, uh, in not very long time from now, um, the climate will change so that the forest has no further place to go and the forest will disappear and with it, Pseudophilatus hankani. So this is happening uh, in different ways all over the world and it's a really serious problem. It's not a problem that necessarily has um, easy solutions. In some cases, we can take species that are threatened into captivity. In some cases, we can restore habitats. In some cases, we can stop pollution. But how do you stop climate change uh, in, a, in an interval short enough where it's gonna stop species from going extinct? It's a serious problem. So would you say that conservation efforts keep pace at the moment with the extinction crisis or, or are they not? Conservation pace? efforts are, some conservation efforts are working very successfully but others are not. We Again, we have a, a series of different situations, some that are easy to address, some that are more so. So uh, conservationists are working very hard. Uh, and in some cases, their efforts are very successful. Um, but in other cases, it's hard to see how they're going to work, given all of the forces that they're working against. Yeah. What new types of technologies do conservationists have at their disposal and do scientists have at their disposal? There are an awful lot of new technologies that we are bringing to bear to study amphibian biology. Um, first off, uh, whereas traditionally one would study amphibians in terms of what they look like, whether it's externally in terms of their body proportions and color or internally with x-rays uh, looking at the skeleton, uh, we now can do much more sophisticated digital imaging. Uh, we can produce three-dimensional uh, views of the skeleton and different organ systems without destroying the specimen. They're really spectacular images and giving us very precise views on what the animal looks like. But um, also equally important, if not more important, is all of the genetic technologies that allow us to sequence DNA and other aspects of the genome of these organisms, which not only uh, tells us um, you know, how if they are different species from others, but it tells us about the health of the populations and tells us about the genetics of the populations. But also now some very sophisticated studies of the genome allow us to tell how the different, a particular species is responding to the invasion of a parasite or to the uh, invasion of, a, of the chytrid fungus how um, different body parts are responding. And with that kind of a, of a um, understanding, we might be able to devise solutions to help the species survive. All right. Well, just in a closing note, uh, what's your favorite species of frog? Ooh, <laughs> my favorite species of frog. I guess I, I have to say it's a species from Puerto Rico that I worked on. For, it's everybody's favorite species of frog. This is the uh, Puerto Rican coqui, Luthorodactylus coqui, which is a beloved species in Puerto Rico. Um, it's, let me see if I can whistle. <laughs> That's a pretty bad um, uh, reproduction of its call. It's called coqui, the name, Luthorodactylus coqui. The, the species name is, is uh, uh, named after its, its the call that males make. Um, it's a beloved species in Puerto Rico, 
and so much so that there's all this lore built up in Puerto Rico. And I learned this years ago because I would capture coquis. They're extremely abundant in Puerto Rico. And we would legally collect some to bring them back to my laboratory to set up a breeding colony because we were studying the developmental biology of coqui. And whenever I would take animals and I'd say to Puerto Ricans who were helping me, I'd say, well, I'm going to take them back to my laboratory and they will breed. And they'd say, oh, no, no, you know, uh, coqui gets so sad when they leave the island that they no longer call. I mean, it's just incredibly tender, incredibly tender, but it's just not true. Um, and, and they call very happily if you give them enough to eat and you give them a lot of moisture and warm, a warm place to hang out. Don't we all? Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure.